薄いのはほスープリズムパワーメイクアップオッケーレディー Welcome to Shoujo and Tell, where we discuss shoujo manga and tell who's hot and who's not, talk about themes, and just generally geek out. Today, August 6th, 2019, we'll be Shoujo and Telling about They Were Eleven, AA Prime, and A Drunken Dream and Other Stories, which are all short works by Moto Hagio. I'm your host, Ashley McDonald, and I'm joined by longtime manga reviewer, Catherine Daisy. Hi, Ashley. Hey. I'm going to call you Kate now. <laughs> yes, excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, great. So, yeah, you've had a long history reviewing manga, so... Yes. I would be... I'm so... Tell the people about all of that. <laughs> okay. It's been about 13 years. I started writing about manga in 2006 for Pop Culture Shock, which is a site that doesn't exist anymore. And then I wrote about manga for the School Library Journal's Good Comics for Kids blog, where I had a column that I called Good Manga for Kids. And uh, I'm not doing that anymore. And then I started a website in 2009 called The Manga Critic, which is part of the Manga Bookshelf Network. Um, so some of the folks I used to know at Pop Culture Shock started Manga Bookshelf, and then I joined up with them. And The Manga Critic just celebrated its 10th anniversary back in April. I've also done a little bit of writing, on published writing on manga. Um, I contributed a chapter to uh, Manga Introduction Challenges and Best Practices, which was a book that the comic book Legal Defense Fund and Dark Horse put out a few years ago, and it's meant for librarians. So that's my history of reviewing manga in a nutshell. So much manga. <laughs> Are libraries getting cool with the, the, the manga again? <laughs> Are they learning? I don't know. I think it goes through cycles. I think there, you know, that there was a big wave maybe 10 years ago that Yalsa started really pushing the idea that manga was important and that it was a great way to bring teens into your library. And they're still recommending quite a bit of manga if you look at their great graphic novels for teens list. There's always great manga on that list. So they're still going on. I don't know how much patrons are taking out manga from libraries. It's almost impossible for me to tell from my local library. They do have a pretty big section of manga. So I'm guessing that that folks in Salem, Massachusetts are, are reading manga and taking it out of the Salem Public Library. But it's hard to know because I, I think most of my impression of how much people were reading manga were, was initially shaped by going to like Borders and Barnes and Noble. R.I.P. Borders. <laughs> right, right. So um, I, I don't know how much manga is circulating now from libraries, but I know that libraries have made a really big push to try and collect it and make it available and, and use it as a way of sort of luring teens in and, and introducing them to the library as a place where they might want to hang out. Yeah, my my uh, used copy of AA Prime actually still has a Borders price tag on the back of it, which brings Ooh. me great joy. <laughs> <laughs> That's an artifact. I know. It's all sorts of artifacts are going on here. Right now. Yeah, like two or three layers for sure. I know. Oh my goodness. Uh, so do you want to describe what They Were Eleven and AA Prime are about? Since A Drunken Dream and Other Stories has like 10 stories into it. We can get into that later. But. Sure. Um, so thumbnail plot for They Were Eleven, it kind of plays out like a Star Trek episode. You have a group of cadets who are taking an exam to get into a space academy so they can all become pilots. I'll call it Starfleet for the sake of convenience, because that's essentially what it is. It's a confederation of planets made up of lots of different races and species. And there is a group of 11 of them who end up on a spaceship as part of the test. There's only supposed to be 10, however. And so you can imagine the discord that's sown by discovering that there's an extra person and nobody can figure out who that extra person is and why they're on the ship. And meanwhile, the ship is starting to break down as it's orbiting the sun. So they have to stay on the ship as long as they possibly can without push pushing the abort button. And... Um, Chaos ensues. Chaos ensues. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I think that's pretty spoiler-free description if they were 11. Yeah. AA Prime is even harder to summarize, but <laughs> it's a collection of three stories. They're kind of mood pieces. And the one common thread that really binds the three stories is a type of character, unicorns, which are actually not horses with horns. In this case, we're talking about a specific group of people who were bred for deep space travel and research. They're emotionless, they have very high IQs, and they have a really distinctive physical appearance, a shock of red hair and a sort of a crest on their head. And these unicorns occur in all three stories in AA Prime. And in two of them, the same human character who has some supernatural abilities also appears. So he also becomes a kind of unifying element in the stories. 
Yeah. And so <laughs> you... so far I'm really selling the hell. I know. No, well, I think what makes them <laughs> unique is that it's like it's one of the few sci-fi shoujo things around yes. that I'm aware of. Yeah. After you you mentioned that, I I went through your list because you said please save my Earth, and I was like that would have been the first thing if somebody told me name me three shoujo sci-fi series. And you know, I was surprised at how little there really is. Um, I don't think I can name three. <laughs> well, the Clamp has worked in that area a couple times. Clover and X are both shoujo. Natsumi Itsuki wrote Juose. I don't know if you ever read that. That was a Tokyo Pop special. I didn't read that one. Um, Moon Child is some of that CMX classic man- manga weirdness. Um, and then uh, the only other thing I could find was AI Revolution, which is something I had a dim memory of reading maybe 10 years ago. But it was a um, a shoujo romance with a robot. Oh, well, I mean. Or I'm something like, along those lines. <laughs> I'm like, okay, is Absolute Boyfriend a sci-fi then? Yeah. She loves a robot. <laughs> well, it, I don't know. I This was a little more explicitly science fiction, though, because it was like there was a, a subplot with androids and cloning and. And I, it was a little bit more than a plot contrivance. It it had more mm-hmm. of a sci-fi vibe than that. But yeah, there really isn't a lot. And I don't know that there's a good answer for why there isn't. I know. I mean, I, I, like I understand books, like sci-fi books as well, are generally more of a male space. But I'm like, oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> right. Well, especially because there are so many great female creators working in science fiction across lots of different media. And so... I, I don't know why there isn't a lot. I mean, maybe it has to do with the editorial biases at some of these shoujo magazines or, you know, they do reader polls and girls are like, ooh, I don't like science fiction. And yet I, I just don't know. I mean, um, it's some of the most interesting stuff, particularly some of the most interesting classic manga is in that that particular genre. And uh, I don't know why there isn't more, but I'd love to read more. I know. Reading this, I was like, this is shockingly like way more <laughs> sci-fi and intensely. Out. I know. And like is queer and everything that I thought it would be. I know it's the most bizarre combination of being like a 13 year old girl's diary, hard science fiction. It's queer as hell. And in a really fabulous, positive way that I I don't know if whether or not that was intended when it was written, but it's, it's sort of beautifully queer in that way too. It's all those things. And it's, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, words are sort of escaping me right now because I'm sort of (laughs) caught up in the, the tumult of emotion that 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 goes along with every every plot development in these stories. Oh yeah, they're very emotional. I, I really <laughs> you got into them and all these yeah. things. I don't know. This is also just like a good reminder. Like I think I had my mind blown when I went to a publishing course in like 2012. And you know David Levithan, who's a big YA author, he was just like YA is not a genre. Like it's just an age designation that has all the genres within it. And I'm like, oh yeah. And like shoujo is not a genre. It's just like right. a weird marketing term. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, things that you think ought to be shoujo aren't. I mean, Keiko Takamiya's work, like uh, they were uh, Tutera and um, Andromeda stories. Those are both actually written for shonen magazines. But the artwork looks a lot like the artwork in AA Prime and, and Drunken and Dream. And they were 11. Um, and it's got, you know, like all the characters have galaxy eyes and there's a lot of fervent conversations about reproduction and and parent child relationships and emotion and, and all of the things that I associate with um, Hagio's work. So it's it's really interesting to to see that that, you know, just by virtue of where it was published, it was understood as being shown in magazine, uh, shown in material. So I know this is what baffles me. I think right now, like. Boys Over Flowers has a second season that's also in Shonen Jump. And I'm like, this is so weird and confusing. I'm so confused. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's wow. baffling. I don't understand. But yes. It is. Um, so, you know, you were the one who suggested that we read yeah. these things. You did give me other options. But I, I chose this one because like, this sounds intriguing. And, and Beyond the Connection to the, the Pope Clan by Moto Hagio wow. is, is coming out. It will be out by the time this podcast comes out. Yeah. From Fantagraphics. So, but beyond that connection, like, why did you want to discuss these in particular? Well, I'd say two reasons. First, I love short story collections. And in fact, I wish they were more available in English because I often find longer serialized stories start really well and then start to peter out somewhere around 
volume 10 or 20. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, it's, it's that, that sort of, I get this fatigue sometimes. And there are authors who can write longer form stories and it, the story just feels like the author carefully mapped everything out and the characters develop and the arcs are very satisfying. You know, I, I think about someone like Naoki Urasawa, somebody who writes that way. And I'm happy to read 25 volumes of a series that he's written. But increasingly, I find myself getting really impatient. And so I like short story collections because they let you sample an author, get to know what kind of genres that author works in, you know, familiarize you with their artwork. And then you really get to see how good their storytelling craft is, because if you've only got 15 or 20 pages to tell a story, you really have to kind of strip things down to their essence and you have to be really economical. So I think Adio does that really well. I'd also put people like Rumiko Takahashi, um, Katsuhiro Otomo, and Osama Tezuka in that category, partly because some of their stories are a little bit more playful than the longer form series that they're known for. Um, Tezuka's stories are bananas. I mean, he's really experimental and sometimes really like sometimes you're like, what? This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> he's like, I don't care. I, yeah, he's just like, ooh, let's have, you know, and he just comes up with crazy, crazy ideas. And not all of them are successful, and some of them are, are flat out terrible, but it's kind of fun to watch him experiment with these ideas and just kind of throw spaghetti at the wall. And he doesn't test your patience because they're like 20 or 30 pages. So for me, I think that was part of the appeal. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing, of course, is that her short stories, I think, are more accessible than some of her longer works. Otherworld Barbara, for example, is really kind of this gorgeous, messy fever dream. And it doesn't really hang together very well. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's probably best read when, you know, you've had about two glasses of wine and you're in this right frame of mind to listen to it and you're sort of caught up in the emotion and it's washing over you and you're not thinking too hard about the plot mechanics um, because there's a whole lot of stuff in it that doesn't make a lot of sense on a, sometimes on a page by page basis. Hmm. And there's a lot of really bald exposition, like, as you know, I'm your dad. Whoa. <laughs> you know, and it, it just, you know, it, the scenes show a lot more, even though there's some ravishingly beautiful scenes in other world Barbara. So for me, I think these short story collections are the perfect distillation of what Hajio does best as an artist and a writer. They're really emotional. And I think for me, as I, I was saying earlier, every time I read them, it transports me back to that period when I was about 12, 13 years old. And they reconnect me to how I felt at that age and how intensely I experienced those emotions when I was that age. And they do so in a way that feels really authentic. I, you know, I don't I don't feel like I'm reading a story an adult has written for a teenager. I feel like she's somehow channeling her own experiences at that age and capturing it in the stories that she's telling without explicitly making them YA or stories mm. about teenagers. So that's why I thought it'd be really fun to talk about these stories with someone else. Yeah, that, that YA point really strikes me because I'm like, yeah, these are all about pretty young people, but I definitely never interpreted them as for like young adults necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think, you know, so many of the themes in them are really resonant. They they offer so many readings and at different stages of your life, you, you, they invite you to read them differently as opposed to feeling like you've outgrown them. I'm like, you know, there's definitely manga that I've I've read where I felt sort of like groaning the whole way through because I was like, I haven't been this dippy and boy crazy since I was 14. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and it sort of feels like a chore to read them. But this, you know, I, I just felt like it, it gave me more insight into the person I was when I was that age, when I was reading it as an adult. And, you know, I didn't read it as a teenager. I, I found out about They Were 11 by reading someone's live journal. Oh. <laughs> Boy, talking about like ancient history. We've been talking about borders I know. and all this other stuff. But CMX dead. Journal. Borders dead. <laughs> live journal. Borders, what's that? <laughs> yeah. So I read about somebody's live journal and I was like, that sounds really cool. And I remember ordering the copies off of eBay, the Flower Comics edition. I think I, it cost me like 99 cents. It was probably more expensive to ship the comics to me than, than to actually buy them. And I was blown away. And that, that started me on my, my journey with the, this material. Yeah, so I definitely didn't read them until you were like, let's do it. And I was like, cool, let me go find some copies of those things. Well, I'm glad you were able to find copies because as you point, you know, as, as we noted when we were going back and forth and talking about what we were going to cover, um, this stuff is all out of print. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. 
And uh, I'm glad that there's an e- a cheap way to get They Were 11 because I for show Joe stories, which is the the oh my the god volume that it's also yeah. so people some of their people asking like a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks for a copy. Oh yes, yeah. So I'm I'm glad that there's a cheaper way to get your hands on it without going to scans. I know. Okay. Well, the the story behind for jo- show Joe stories though is like pretty funny and bananas to me though. So. <laughs> So apparently back in the day in like 1995 or something, (laughs) Biz was like, hey, we have the rights to all these short stories. And then they were like, cool. And they're from like different authors and everything. So then they're like, okay, let's put it in a collection. And so I work in publishing in like a a digital uh, publisher tech side of things. And I, when I heard that story, I was like, oh, no, this is going to be like a, a, a rights issue. You know, like they, they mm-hmm. didn't really clear. Apparently, they did not clear with, you know, the initial publishers to publish them as one thing. So they're all from like right. different places and all these things. So then this is like, well, whatever. They can't do anything. We already published it. And then the publishers are very uh, stingy. <laughs> so they were like, no, <laughs> stop publishing it. Like, recall all the copies that you possibly can. <laughs> Yeah. Take that, no, it's, And I know, and it's such a shame because they're actually, the four stories fit together really nicely that they, you know, that the it's sort of bookended by two stories that are a little bit more rooted in the real world. Hmm. And then it has those two sort of glorious sci-fi sagas in the middle that feel like they're sort of, you know, from sort of of a, of a piece with one another. So it's kind of a shame that it, you know, Viz kind of whiffed it on the rights with that because <laughs> it would be amazing to see it in print again. There is a Japanese publisher who just put out an anthology of classic shoujo sci-fi stories from the 70s and 80s, but it hasn't been, no one's picked it up for for distribution in the United States. I think it came out about a year or two years ago, because I saw something about it on Anime News Network. And uh, I was, you know, I was like, woo, and then and this is timely, you know, and I started <laughs> looking around and, and nobody's nobody's licensed it. But it'd be great to get it over here just to to have those stories again in print and and maybe to see some authors who haven't been represented in English before. I know, Viz, get on it. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> you need to take these chances. Come on. That's right. Well, we, I think that's what we're going to have to do periodically, which is pause it. Viz, get on it. You know? Viz, come Viz, on. Come on. <laughs> But yeah, so They Were 11, though, was published in floppies that are yes. pretty cheap on eBay. Like, you can get each one for, like, 2 to $3. <laughs> so yeah. that's not so bad. So I would recommend, yeah, starting there if you're, like, curious and you haven't read these stories before. Like, you can go get It's weird to read con- uh, manga in floppies, at least for me. I was like, this is strange, <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's a different experience, especially if when they... they, they break up the story into sort of standard floppy length, which is really about 32 to 48 pages when they do that. It's it's really weird to read manga in that kind of format because, you know, you're used to getting a, a chunk of like, you know, 160 or 180 pages in one go. And it's even weirder when you're you're reading like uh, something like Urusei Yatsura or some, uh, you know, some other really early stuff that Viz serialized that way. Sometimes the format just doesn't feel quite right for the story. Yeah, it, it kind of tricked me. Like, I was like, oh, yeah, they were 11. That'll be easy to read. It's not that long. And then I'm like, actually, it's like basically the length of a manga <laughs> just split into four very big floppy volumes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is kind of like, it's sort of like a novella. Like, that's how if someone asked me, like, if I want to be really pretentious yeah. about it, that's, that's the word <laughs> It's I true. Use. It's a little <laughs> bit shorter than a normal volume of manga. Like, it's missing like yeah. a chapter. <laughs> so. Yes. Um, but yeah, as we mentioned before, the Po Clan, which is also by Motohagio, is yes. currently being published by Fantagraphics. So if right. you know, you gotta go support the the old stuff if we want to have any hope of more of it coming over here. So everybody, yeah. go buy the Po Clan. <laughs> yeah, and the Fantagraphic editions of of, of Hagio's work are beautiful. Um, if you've looked at Heart of Thomas, if you looked at Other World Barbara. Um, they're hardcover books, they, you know, big trim size, good paper, great translations. I think Rachel Thorne has been responsible for all of the translations as she was for um, They Were 11 and AA Prime. Yes. They're really it's just like it's really, really well done. A Drunken Dream has uh, this great interview with Moto Hagio that Rachel Thorne did, as well as a reprint of an article that appeared on the Comics Journal about her work. So it's it's definitely worth spending a little bit of extra money on on those editions because fanographics is really really taking their responsibility with this material seriously 
I know. Don't get scared or like wait for it to go on sale. Like, go <laughs> wait for it to be <laughs> like 20% off. <laughs> like, right. At your Barnes and Noble, the one big <laughs> the box one store. Barnes and Noble left in your neighborhood. Yeah. Yes. You got to go there. <laughs> so I feel a little like ignorant in this regard, but I do know that Moto Hagio is very, you know, there there is a shift in the 70s mm-hmm. towards like shoujo becoming this. The genre that it basically more is today, not a genre, right. but you know the 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 marketing term that it is today, yeah. uh, and all these styles. And I know that she's very important to that, but uh, I don't actually know that much about it. But I, I feel that it is important to note that in general. <laughs> well, yeah. If you look at if you look at the history of magazine publishing in Japan in the 20th century, you can find girls' magazines going back to the beginning of the century, and they often had short stories and illustrations in them. And those were the sort of forerunners for modern shoujo manga magazines. Um, You can find magazines for kids, you know, in the 1920s, 1930s that have, you know, stories with animals and and adventures and that sort of thing. And those are a little bit more gender neutral. And then after World War II, some of the first manga written specifically for girls were written by men. Lots of male manga artists broke into the industry writing that way. And the stories that they were telling were pretty innocent, you know, an or a girl thinks she's an orphan and then she discovers her true family. You know, she's her parents are are fabulous and wealthy and somehow she's been separated from them and then she's happily reunited with them. And our modern sense of what shoujo is, the sort of dynamism through which it's the stories are told, the emphasis on interiority and all of that starts to emerge in the 60s and 70s with a generation of female artists who are beginning to enter the profession in mass. You know, there had been examples of women before, uh, this, you know, if you think about the strip Seizeshan, debuted in 1946. It was uh, written by Michiko Hasegawa. Uh, it was a newspaper comic strip, and she's really one of the first important female comic artists in Japan. Then as you get into the 60s, you have people like Hideko Mizuno, and then she's followed by a wave of young women like Keiko Takamiya and Moto Hajio, who are you know, building on the legacy of people like Osama Tezuka and taking it in a new direction, that they were inspired by his layouts and by his treatment of like the page itself and the panel shapes and and the way in which he he brought this kind of cinematic flair to his storytelling. But they brought a whole other dimension that's that's missing from something like Princess Knight, which is basically kind of an action adventure story with a very conventional ending. You know, Princess Sapphire hangs up her sword and she decides she's going to be, you know, sort of assume a a conventional feminine role as wife and mother. But if you look at the stuff that's coming out in the 70s, you start to see these really innovative, you know, layouts where people are sometimes just obliterating panels and they're using all the signification, you know, Mm. flowers and galaxy eyes and sparkles Mm. and characters sort of falling through space and, and all these things to sort of try and suggest the intensity with which the characters are feeling things and allow you to sort of step into the character's head for a moment and and appreciate it. But also to tell stories that spoke more specifically to girls. You know, not that Princess Knight doesn't, but if you think about something like A.A. Prime, it resonated with me because it reminded me of reading things like Madeline Langle and and, you know, Frances Hodgson Burnett and Ellen Montgomery. And it, it, you know, it sort of builds on that legacy. And it just has a really different sensibility than the kind of um, shoujo that male artists were creating for girls in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, and all the impressions I've gotten so far of, of these old things that I've read, like Claudine and The Rose of Versailles, mm-hmm. I'm like, they're all also right? so queer. What's going on? It's they great. are. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't know that I have a good answer for that. I'm sure, you know, that sounds like a question to ask Rachel Thorne, you know, to to sort of think about it. But I I think on a sort of basic level, you know, one of the things I've spent a lot of time thinking about when I was sort of thinking about some of the characters who are androgynous or non-binary or hermaphroditic, depending on, on... the story that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it is, is for me, I remember being about 12 years old and having this epiphany about misogyny, about gender roles that it just never really occurred to me before. And it hit me really hard. And I could see that happening to other girls my age and seeing them respond in lots of different ways. You know, some people sort of embracing their their emerging sexuality and the attention they were getting for being, you know, female, 
um, other people sort of tenaciously clinging to their childhood as a way of almost remaining non-binary or um, androgynous. Mm. And then other people feeling a lot of, like me, feeling a lot of trepidation about it, like not feeling comfortable with that kind of attention and not comfortable with the idea necessarily that I had to be a wife and mother, that that was, that was sort of preordained. And I think that part of the queerness sort of speaks to that, that it it kind of allows you to a space to plug into that discourse without it explicitly being about getting a boyfriend or getting married or, or some of those things that might sometimes feel like an abstraction or a terrifying abstraction when you're 12 or 13 years old. Yeah. Being more about like your, your fundamental identity is changing, not yeah. just in relation to other people, but like yeah. your own self identification is getting like, Whoa, blown up here. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, and I think, too, you know, men have always been free to have adventures. And so some of these characters, like if you think about Lady Oscar and the Rose of Versailles, or you think about Claudine, they're allowed to these characters who we understand some level as being women are allowed to, you know, allowed to have male privilege and act on it and be bold and decisive and you know, and, and have lots of authority and agency in a way that I think sometimes female characters aren't allowed to, or at least in that time period, they, it would have been un, more unusual to see a, a female character that feisty and sort of self-possessed. So I think that some of that, that queerness too speaks to, you know, just wanting to be able to present women doing something bold, but sort of having to sort of work around mm. gender stereotypes to do it. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So from here on out, I will give the spoiler warning. I realize I didn't really okay. give that <laughs> clearly. Okay. But so from here on out, we will clearly spoil what goes on in They Were Eleven and uh, AA Prime and some of the short yes. stories. So, you know, if you haven't read those things, you you might not want to listen or maybe you do. I don't know. I don't control you. <laughs> that's, that's your choice. <laughs> but you've been warned is really the thing here. Um, so then we're going to start with the because it, it leads in, you know, this queerness talk leads into a question we got on Twitter yes. uh, from at brainchild129, who has been on this podcast to discuss the key to the kingdom and the full-time wife escapist. Uh, and the question is, do you think that Hagio's portrayal of non-binary characters in They Were Eleven and some of the other short stories holds up to our modern understanding about gender? And, I, you know, to answer that question, I feel like we have to first establish what our moder modern understanding of gender is. <laughs> yes. So I actually tried to discuss this with my my roommate and best friend is transgender. He lives with me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I was like, OK, let me make sure that my understanding is clear. <laughs> let me make sure I'm somewhat up to date. Yeah. And, you know, it's like gender is fluid. It's it's not a binary. There's no male, female. Like you, it's a sliding scale. You can be like 59 percent male, 41 percent <laughs> right. female. Like it's not. It doesn't have to be this clear division. Uh, it is not related to sex, so not related to your sexual organs, not related to your sexual preference and people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is something that you can choose for yourself. So it is in it not being locked into anything, really. You can, you know, you can be assigned female at birth and you can choose to identify as male or there are many designations that I am unaware right. of. I believe like Demi Boy is, is one. There's lots of things that you can choose. Yeah. Well, it's it's I, I like the way that you describe it as a continuum, because I think that's a, a more contemporary discussion. And I think going back and looking at these, because I read these the first time in like 2007, 2008, and I thought they were progressive and bold. And looking back on them now, I'm still... I don't know if I'd quite call them woke, but it's really fascinating <laughs> to see how fundamental that dilemma is. Where do you fall on that continuum in all of the stories that are in a, a prime and also in, in, you know, it's an element and they were 11 and, and to see it foregrounded so specifically. I think one of the things that I'd love to, to know is whether or not anyone ever tried to translate some of the characters as they instead of he or she especially some of the characters who are a little bit more ambiguous or, you know, sort of sit pretty in the middle of that, that gender continuum. And that was rejected because that wasn't standard editorial practice in the United States in say 1995 or <laughs> 1997. Um, or if that's actually in the original text, that would be really interesting to know how much of that is an artifact of the translation and how much of it is inherent in the original story. 
Yeah, that's definitely a question I had, especially with Nuum. Is that is that how we're gonna? I don't know how to say his name. <laughs> the the I, that your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, exactly. So, so the scaly one who tried yes. to be like, no, Froll Froll is uh, very androgynous. So he he actually looks very fem- female, uh, and I believe that his sex is female. Uh, yes. and it's supposed to be a group of all men. So, but Noam is like, no, me and Froll are like the same. I also don't actually have the, you know, like assigned sex organs and stuff. But they also talk about how it's supposed to be a group of men. So, like, they right. identify Noam as as male, and I'm like, it, okay, is this like for real though, or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, he's an interesting character, and, and it's sort of disappointing that he doesn't get developed a little bit more in They Were Eleven. But talking about his experiences on that harsh planet and the whole life cycle of his particular species, where you know they're they're tough and scaly and hermaphroditic, and then you know the sun comes out once every twenty nine years, and they have this brief summer, and they reach their sexual maturity, they have offspring, and then. They, and they, the parent dies and, they, and then the cycle is repeated with the next generation and that he's one of those few people from his planet who gets caught in between the cycles because he doesn't he doesn't come to his sexual maturity. So he's stuck in this kind of liminal state. He's really interesting because, he, of course, he's the only person who recognizes that Froll is sort of in that same kind of a place and recognizes that very early on. They have a, a conversation where he uses his planet's word to describe somebody who is. I guess we might say non-binary or androgynous and um, Froll is a little bit unsettled by that whole experience. And uh, I don't know. I, I think he's an interesting character. And I, I think you're right that everyone talks about the fact that only men are allowed in the Academy and that this is a, an opportunity that's only available to, to men, which adds a sort of another layer on top of the story. But yeah, they're Froll and, and, and Newham are both really interesting characters. And uh I think for Froll, too, I, I, part of the reason I, I was talking about that moment when you're 12 or 13 and you really start to imagine, like, what is it like to be a woman, a grown woman, mm-hmm. is that Froll's whole rationale for being on that ship is to prove that Froll is worthy of being a man. So, to, yeah. you know, to have her family decide that she can, in fact, become a man so she doesn't have to marry some ancient man who has all these wives already and have children, which she doesn't want to do. And uh, she sees this as a way of, way out of that path. And so, you know, when I was thinking about the gender issues around Froll, you know, that was one of the first things that popped to mind alongside sort of thinking about Froll with our modern understanding of queerness and gender identity and sexual orientation. I, you know, I think that was more secondary for me when I was thinking about Froll and just where how old Froll's supposed to be and, and where Froll is in her development. Yeah, Froll is like directly confronting those things, being like, "My future yeah. will be decided by my gender, basically." <laughs> like, and yes, it's it's not subtle. It's, it's <laughs> not of, subtle at all. No, <laughs> no, you get hit in the hammer, you face with a hammer on that one a, a few times. But I, I still think it's handled really beautifully, just because you know you, there are a lot of hints early in the story that there's something going on with Froll, and the tension between Froll and Tata is really interesting. The way that it plays out. And that, you know, Froll's always comparing, I guess I I realize I've, it, over the course of our conversation, I've used him and her, maybe they would probably be a better word in this case, but that Froll's always comparing their physique. And, you know, I've got broader shoulders, you've got smaller hands, that kind of thing. And that there is a dynamic between them that feels almost more like a, a traditional heteronormative screwball comedy. Yeah. <laughs> So there's all those layers to unpack with that particular particular relationship there. I know, yeah, and it's like I get to me I I think the the modernness of it breaks down in that it's like there's still very clearly a binary usually yeah. even in A prime and and then they were 11. Like it's not like they can just choose to be like, "Oh, whatever, we're all just always the same sex organ." Like that's why with Noam it would be interesting to know if he does identify as he, because if he is just like, you know, actually just like, oh, I'm, I'm both like more of a, a two spirit Native American type deal, then that would be right. interesting. Uh, but as we know it, it's like, no, there's very clearly a binary. Like you do have to choose one or the other. You can't just like stay in the, the liminal space <laughs> forever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, if you're if you're thinking about what what makes this more problematic for a modern reader is that there is no recognition that some, there is something beyond 
the social constructs of male and female. And, and then that idea gets hammered on. And then, of course, there's the other problematic thing, which is that in order for some of these relationships to really be acceptable, one of the characters has to decide to become female. Um, there's that dynamic in the final chapter of AA prime in the relationship between Tacto and Mori and, you know, Tacto trying to decide, am I going to be a man? Am I going to be a woman? And in the end, it seems as if Tacto is, is is sort of embracing a a traditional feminine role in the relationship with Mori. And that's sort of a a first, you know, it seems at least as I read it, it, it seemed to imply that Tacto was, was going to be, was willing to become a woman for, for, for Mori's sake. And maybe that's maybe that's me misreading it. But that's you know, it seems like that there that's another thing that by 2019 standards maybe seems a little less um, with it. Yeah, I think there's also the the point with Tacto is that like, you know, Maury's like, so what do you want to be, Tacto? And Tacto's like, well, which one do you prefer to be with, Maury? And Maury's like, no, this isn't my decision. But Tacto also does not like provide a clear answer to the reader. So it's kind of like our last impression of him is trying to like pawn off his identity to somebody else. And it's like, oh, come on, Tacto, (laughs) get it together. (laughs) Well, after, of course, after all the trauma, I mean, Tacto has like dynasty levels of trauma that he endures, you know, both both in the con- in the story itself and then things that happened prior to the story that are fundamental to some of the, the big developments in the end. But, you know, his father who invents the serum that allows people to spontaneously change their uh, sex. That was I was like, yeah. what? I mean, the first time I read that, I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> It was the seventies. I guess it was different, you know. It was a different time then, like right? that, that. But I just I loved it because it was just so out. I mean, like who would have thought of that? Um, you know, and that that actually ends up leading to the great tragedy of of Tacto's mother c- committing suicide in front of her son, and um, you know, because she you know, sort of being stuck in this this in between space between genders and and sexes, and and you know, sort of that trauma has been passed on to Tacto, and that. Tacto's guardian on on is really adamant that Tacto has to be, you know, she's shocked by the revelation that Tacto has two X chromosomes and, you know, and there's all this discussion about hormone treatment and, and that seems in a way oddly contemporary. That's true. Hormone treatment. Yeah, that, that bit. And, and the the speech that you just referenced a minute ago where, you know, Maury says to Tacto, you have to be the one who makes the choice, I suppose, redeems the story from feeling like, Tacto's being forced into, you know, forced into being a woman at the end of the story. But it's it's interesting because it, it feels like it, it resonates with a lot of um, current discussion, for example, about what age somebody can decide mm-hmm. that they, you know, I, I was born in the wrong body. I'm a woman and I want to, tra- you know, I want to complete that full transition to being a, a woman. Um, that there's a tremendous amount of debate about what age that's appropriate in and debate about whether or not parents should be recognizing some of those tendencies in someone who's maybe six or seven years old or maybe 12 years old, you know, sort of trying to decide what at what age somebody knows their own self well enough to to make that choice and and how to facilitate that transition and when it's appropriate for medical intervention. I mean, in that sense, there's a lot of resonance with with the sort of moment that we're living in right now. Yeah, those things are all really difficult because, I, again, it, it, I actually really struggle with our modern sensibility of gender and sex. I, I tried to, again, I, I asked my trans friend, like, you know, what it is. And he's like, OK, I'm going to try to il- illustrate it for you because I have trouble because I'm like, once you decouple everything from everything else, like you can be feminine or masculine without identifying mm-hmm. as male or female or and you don't have to have the sex organs of those things to identify as a certain gender and all these things. And I'm like, okay, Mm -hmm. but at a certain point when everything is just like not necessarily connected to anything else, like what is the point of any of those things? And if gender is a, is a social construct, then like how does somebody who's six years old, like fully understand the gender that has been constructed? Like it's all like very confusing to me sometimes. So I'm like, ah, (laughs) it's very, it gets all like distraught in my mind and stuff so the way he he made me like some uh a chart not charts but like heat graph things where he's like okay the the initial understanding of gender is like genitals equals sex equals gender right. equals identity equals roles equals sexuality and then right. he's like he made more of like a heat map where, where it's like 
sexuality is off in the corner. He wrote an entirely different animal. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. awesome. <laughs> and then it's just like words kind of loosely associated, like somewhat associated by color in this is like assigned sex, genitals, body, hormones, strength, chromosomes, voice. Then mm -hmm. another cluster is like names, identity, pronouns, roles. And then there's presentation, which is like hair, clothes, right. mannerisms. Right. So it's, it's body identity presentation. And yeah, for me, it's just like, oh, it's so cool that these characters in these manga are exploring this. It sucks that they're like stuck in a dichotomy that they like don't seem to necessarily want to be in all the time. Well, you know, the 70s were kind of queer in their own special way. I mean, if you think about and, you know, this comes up, I teach a class on the history of rock. And when we watch rock performance from the 70s, um, you know, it, it's on this really fascinating continuum because you have this incredible homoeroticism in performance. So you have people like, you know, Robert Plant and Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin up on stage. And I don't think Robert Plant wore a shirt at any point in the 1970s. And he's up there and he's wearing these jeans. They're like hanging on his hip bones and they're really tight. And he's not <laughs> got a shirt on. He's got a little bolero jacket. And, mm. and he's sort of like strutting around the stage with his long flowing locks and singing at Jimmy Page. And there's this like really homoerotic element to the performance, but it's also understood as being sort of like hyper masculine. And then you have people like Freddie Mercury and David Bowie who are inhabiting a totally different space as a strategy for engaging the audience. I mean, David Bowie sort of defy, you know, mm -hmm. when I, I think about some of the characters in AA prime, I think a lot of you know, his, Ziggy, his Ziggy Stardust persona and the man who fell to earth and, and, and that sort of phase in, in Bowie's journey as a, as a musician, because it seems like Bowie himself was, was actively resisting and challenging that binary. Um, you know, the Ziggy Stardust character is really hard to pin down. I mean, the word most people use to describe it is androgynous mm. because, you know, the way he sort of simultaneously has feminine and masculine traits or things that are sort of commonly understood as being feminine and masculine. And then there's this really aggressive sexual energy and flirtation with the audience and, it it's out, you know, yeah. it's really out. And so I can see how some of that might've, you know, if, if you've been watching a Led Zeppelin concert or, you know, you, you came across the, you know, David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust album, how some of that stuff might've sort of percolated through your consciousness and, and manifested itself this way in the science fiction story. Yeah, that makes sense. There's like so much going on. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of like, I guess the 70s are the time where we realize like, oh, everything that we think of is hyper masculine. Maybe it's all just homoerotic instead, you know? Like, right. Well, like <laughs> disco is, I mean, think about disco and the incredible crazy backlash that disco engendered at the end of the 70s with, you know, the, the disco sucks rally in Comiskey Park, which happened in 1979. But it was a total backlash to the idea that men had to get dressed up look nice, learn how social dance moves so they could do partner <laughs> dancing out at, at the discotheque and and then to dance to music that was being, you know, performed by a lot of women of color, a lot of queer vocalists and, you know, floating on top of this, you know, shimmering disco beat. And it seemed to embody a totally different value system than than rock. And so you have this interesting moment in the 70s where, you know, sort of queer culture be seems like it's going to become mainstream. I mean, there was this moment in, in like 1979 where disco was just absolutely inescapable. You know, Ethel Merman put out a desk disco album. You know? Yeah. Ethel Merman. Ethel Merman. It's just as awful as it sounds. And, <laughs> and yet, you know, it's like if Ethel Merman's doing it and Sesame Street has a Cookie Monster disco record and, and you know, and everything gets the word disco slapped on it, then, you know, it, it seemed like maybe this, this was a mo tipping point. And then we have this huge backlash and and that, you know, sort of disco culture and, and the queerness that it was bringing into the spotlight sort of recedes a little bit. So, you know, when I'm thinking about where all Hagio stuff fits into the 70s and the early 80s, I think a lot about that particular moment and, and that moment where, you know, fashion was pretty, I wouldn't quite say unisex, but, mm. you know, if you look at how people were dressing in the 70s, that sort of hyper feminine style that became really popular in the Reagan years with like really, you know, show, you know, exaggerated shoulders, really nipped in waist, tight skirts, you know, yeah. super high heels, giant hair, that kind of thing. I think is, you know, it's, it's just sort of the, the total visual opposite of how people were dressing in the seventies, which is sort of like earthy and shapeless, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
comfortable. Everything, everybody looks comfortable. Everybody looks comfortable. No, yeah, I definitely think of like, so even with Tata, I was like, is Tata male or female in the beginning? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> could, yeah. go, could go either way. And then like at the end, uh, the last shot of them like all walking away after they've, they've passed the test and everything. And they're like, ah, oh, we're going on to our separate futures, whatever. I'm like, all of you look feminine. Like King is like wearing high heels and all these things. Yep. I'm like, what's up? <laughs> Yeah, and some of the men had hair I would kill for. I, I have I know, to right? say, I was like, that, I want my hair to do that. Um, yeah, no, it's it's really, I just, I love it because it's just so, it's just weird and out in a great way that invites so many different readings. And you could be totally oblivious to all the, that subtext and totally enjoy it, or you could read it and it could resonate with you in a way that it wouldn't resonate with me as, you know, a cisgendered woman in her 40s, you know, and so... I think that's one of the things that's really beautiful about it. Yeah, and I think it's it's fun because, you know, I feel like so many queer stories are always just like, this is about queerness. But I'm like, I actually don't feel like They Were Eleven is necessarily about, like, it, it comes down on that pretty hard sometimes. But overall, it's like a psychological story of, like, how can we trust anybody? And in that way, the, yeah. the like gender aspect is, is great and fascinating because the way that they start to actually bond with each other at all in the story... Mm -hmm. is through being like, uh, well, Froll is weird. We have to, like, figure out Froll <laughs> and, like, all these right. things. And then in trying to figure out Froll, which they, like, do not do in that moment because, like, Froll is a complicated human who's, like, still figuring stuff out themselves. Uh, but the, it, it makes them talk about all the planets that they're from. And then they're, like, focus more on the similarities in the end. They're like, oh, we all have, like, different creation stories, but they're all, like, basically the same isn't that fun yeah. yay like <laughs> yeah well that's what i mean that's why it, it feels like the queerest episode of star trek ever made you know it's like <laughs> because it has those great moments where they're they're comparing notes as you say about the, their origin stories and you get each character gets a chance to say like why they're participating in this exercise and what it means for them and what opportunities it it, it becomes and you get a little glimpse into the sort of class system in this united federation of planets and 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 all the different cultures that are represented there and and what it's like to sort of be on the cusp of adulthood because all those characters are are really sort of sitting in that space and yeah it's it's a lot of fun i love that i they were were 11 is definitely one of my all-time favorite short stories yeah no i almost i was i regret that i didn't have enough time to like reread it <laughs> like i only read it once why it was so good <laughs> i'm sure yeah. i get more out of it the second time yeah so do we want to talk about A Drunken Dream or did you want to talk a little bit about more about AA Prime? Because we talked a little bit about Tacto and Mori, but we didn't really talk about uh, the first story, which is first yeah. two stories, which are actually in some ways even weirder. Than, than They're the definitely one. weirder. <laughs> yeah. So where do you want to start? Well, I also wanted to mention that, like, to me, I'm like, it would be correct that Tacto in Japanese would be referring to himself by male pronouns because he talks mm -hmm. in the third person. Right. Uh, so I'm like, that would be a translation. That would be like an actual translation thing. And I'm like, that must be so weird. Like, he is so aggressively trying to confirm his gender identity. And I'm like, oh, yes. poor Tacto. <gasps> poor Tacto. He just needs a hug. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, definitely. Well, I felt that about all of the unicorns. They all sort of needed a, needed a hug. So do you want to go back to the first story or do you want to talk a little bit more about Tacto and Mori? Um, no, we can we go, go to the first story because the first story is definitely like... It has so many standard sci-fi elements, but I feel like, again, it's just like, you know what? I'm not going to, I have no subtlety. I'm just going to like hit them on the head so hard. So like, to me, it reminded me of, so it's about this first story, the actual titular story of the, the collection <laughs> right? is about Addie, who is a unicorn, uh, but she has died and, but she has a clone. But the clone is from like three years ago. <laughs> And but they're like, oh well, we have to keep doing research on this planet or whatever. So and Addie's the best at it. So we're gonna send, you know, three years prior Addie back, <laughs> clone back to this this planet, where everybody who she's known for those three years still is. So they're like, oh, the little Addie's back, and I'm like, that's weird. That's very weird for them to behave that way. First of all. And then there's the only one who doesn't really behave that way is you know the one who was romantically involved with her. What was his name Reg? 
Yes. Yes, Reg. So he was like... With two Gs. <laughs> with two Gs, y'all. Yes. yes, exactly. So Reg was like, no, it's not Addy, it's a clone. And then, of course, like, he goes away and, and he dies. And now, like, his clone is somehow involved. And so, it, to me, it's, it's weird because I feel like there's, there's plenty of clone stories out there mm-hmm. and all these things. But normally, I, I feel like they don't have to necessarily interact with people who, like, blatantly know that they're a clone or, like... <laughs> Are trying to treat them like they're not a clone necessarily. Like it reminded right. me of a uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's uh, what's that book called? Uh, uh, are you talking about? Is it Never Let You Go? Never... Yeah, no, Never Let Me Go. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is a. It does raise really interesting ethical questions, you know, about the the whole cloning process and how the people in the space station are supposed to interact with Addie's clone when she arrives and. And, you know, the, there's a whole sequence where you know, people are, are trying to interact with her as they, ha- you know, the original Addie. And, of course, she doesn't have the memories of interacting with them. And they, they keep trying to adjust their expectations and, and interact with her in a way that feels natural. And, you know, that that to me feels like a I couldn't offhand name a specific sci-fi story that did that. But then there's this overlay, like the, the, the shoujo-ness that comes in, like the, this, the utter shoujo, like that opening bit where she, the clone is is recovering some of Addie's memories and has this brief memory of Pony, which you, you know, when we were corresponding about what we were going to talk about, you mentioned this. And I don't know if you want to take that idea and run with it, but I, I thought that that was like, for me, that sequence of flashing back to this really painful, terrible moment in at the original Addie's childhood and having this memory that, that, that pops up and the clone of course hasn't lived through it, but, but feels it like she has. Yeah, still and, feels and it she wakes up weeping. Yeah. yeah. Like I was like, Oh, that's so shoujo. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> the most shoujo thing. <laughs> yeah. All they needed were like some flowers and sparkles and that would make it like the ultimate the shoujo. Ultimate shoujo is just needed some yeah. But you were, this. you were raising this really interesting point and I don't know if you want to take that ball and run with it. Cause I, I think that that's a, a really interesting, the point you were making about ponies and unicorns was actually really interesting. Yeah. So I keep trying to be like, I don't feel like I quite have it like squared away in my mind, but I'm just like, so beyond this gender thing, like most of the stories have to do with you know, just like finding yourself or whatever you have, like, it's like literally they have different selves. Like there's a clone and like, you know, there's, there's this added layer with Addie where it's like, okay, she's a clone and like not human. She's this weird unicorn thing. (laughs) Right. And I like to think that as a child, I guess, Addie was like very distraught by all these things. So, you know, she has a pony that, that dies and that's like very distraught by her. And, and, it starts off with, you know, like lowercase p, like it's like this is a pony. But then at some point it's just like, no, she just calls the pony pony like that. Its name is pony. And it's like, right. wait a minute. <laughs> so this could just be like any pony. Like there is that sort of, you know, mm-hmm. any pony uh, dying sort of thing. So there's both a, a distance from it, but also like a very, very like all ponies matter sort of thing. <laughs> I don't know. You know, like, yeah. And it's like, it would be like if Addie was called Unicorn, like it's not just like, oh, and, and Unicorn over here is, right. uh, you know, doing the thing. So there's very much like this this struggle between like, oh, is is Addie just a unicorn? Because many people point out how she's like cold and like they're not really, the unicorns apparently aren't supposed to have feelings, even though, of course, that's always nonsense. They <laughs> totally have feelings. Right. Uh, she just expresses them differently than a human because, like, whatever we program them that way. I don't know. <laughs> like, so, so yeah, there's there's just just like all these these elements, and you know, it's like the pony somehow gets like frozen in this memory with this clone, and like Addie's kind of stuck. Addie's like literally frozen somewhere <laughs> in like a tundra land, like right. OG Addie. <laughs> you know. <laughs> then there's the clone who's like living this on loop sort of thing because everybody keeps projecting their memories of previous Addie onto her and she's like what am I supposed to like like black coffee now or like with sugar like what's up I like it black but you tell me I don't right. it's very confusing <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah no I thought I thought that that was a really interesting point you made because it as you say it's this this symbolic it's 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 a, a time loop that the, this this clone is experiencing and sort of feeling a little almost asynchronous, like I, I, she's in a different timeline than everybody else on the space station, and yet she's haunted by this memory, this experience that really isn't hers. And then, you know, it, when it ends and we meet Reg's clone, 
she feels relieved because she feels like the clone is the only person who will sort of understand her predicament and for whom her telling the story of the pony is going to be an authentic experience. And I thought that that was sort of a, an interesting way to end the story, you know, cause I, I wasn't really, the first time I read it, I wasn't really sure where it was going. And then I, I just thought that was sort of a, a brilliant answer to that loop that instead of just sending endless, endless replacements that now we have these two clones of people who had originally been together and, they have the memories of those two people bef from before they met. And so there's a, a purity to their interactions that isn't true of, of their interactions with the rest of the crew. And it's a, it's a really interesting and, and cool resolution to that story. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, so everybody has to become a clone now. Y'all got to die. <laughs> Only right. the clones can interact with other clones. That's basically, which, but yeah, it's so weird. Cause it's like, Oh, it's a clone. Plus the unicorn thing. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot of elements to deal with in like 40 pages. <laughs> you know, like what's going on? Uh, and then it goes into the second story, which like, right. so the, the three remaining stories are all connected. Whereas the first right. one is still like, it's like, ah, that's just, that's just set up for, for these, these three stories. Yeah, well, the, I think the the most disturbing by far is the, the plot line involving um, Maury and Trill. I, I think partly because Trill... Unlike the unicorns, uh, other unicorns that you encounter over the course of that, that that collection of stories, Trill really seems to have the mind of a child. She has yeah. a lot of difficulty speaking and forming thoughts, of giving really meaningful consent to anything, and you know she's being subjected to these terrible experiments. And Maury's intense interest in her and his romantic interest in her feels deeply problematic. I mean, I don't know if it did to readers in the you know when it was originally published, but certainly in 2019. It, it's it's the scene, for example, where he he tries to kiss her, and then, then he's he's furious because she he he feels like she's only reciprocating because it, the way a child would reciprocate if he said I love you. I, I read that and I was like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> it was, a, that one definitely like the most uncomfortable one in this collection. Both because yeah, Trill is like because everybody's just using trill for and it does address that overtly like yes. um Maury's mom is like you are just doing the same thing as the the doctor that you hate who's doing terrible experiments on her yeah because you're just using her for your own gains to like help your telekinesis powers and like right. as feel one fulfilled does, yes. yeah as one does you know you just <laughs> borrow the cool looking unicorns to the unicorns are very cool looking i do like their their red mane thing i got to say yeah. <laughs> No. Although I wish it was in color. I mean, you know, you just sort of have to project that onto the designs. But I agree. I like that. It's subtle. Like, it's just something that makes them look a little bit otherworldly. And it's it's done just deftly enough that you get a sense that they're a little bit strange, even though they look essentially human. And uh, and I think that that, you know, it's just a, a tiny little detail, but it, it carries through in all of the stories. It carries through pretty well. Yeah. Don't but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he really knows how to pick them, doesn't he? <laughs> Maury. <laughs> oh, this boy. You know, I mean, you know, his whole dilemma and the, the you know, meeting Tacto and, and seeing echoes of Trill's face and, and all of that, you know, it was interesting. I, I think for me, I, going back and rereading the story with, with Trill and the doctor, I was just, that was, it, it, it made me even more uncomfortable. I mean, I remember sort of feeling Maury's outrage the first time I read it and and seeing that story through his eyes the first time I read it and then coming back and reading it again many years later I had just a very a, a very different reaction to it very visceral um and I think I saw it more the way Maury's mom did that you know mm. he's Maury is not seeing the way in which he's imposing himself on on Trill and altering her life in ways that mean that she's she's sort of on a collision course with you know disaster and i think of the of the stories in there that's the most problematic it does have some of the most amazing art though i have to say that the shared dream that maury and trill have in that story is really a master class in how to depict a nightmare <laughs> they have this dream where he sees a, what looks like, you know, a butterfly collector's case full of, of specimens. You know, there are all these corpses and they have a leptopterdis. Oh, I can't say that word. I should never say it. But how about we just say butterfly collectors <laughs> pin that has been pushed through them into that like black velvet. And that's what it looks like. And you see these bodies strewn around. And, you know, 
the full horror of what the doctor is doing to to Trill really comes through in that image in a way that them simply talking about it doesn't or or just acknowledging that Trill is being violated. You know, you just get this this just sort of horrible vision of what's happening and all of the emotion and the confusion that Trill is feeling. And it's so powerful because it's just a couple of panels. It's, you know, it's it doesn't go on and on. It, it The imagery isn't sort of falsely surreal like sometimes when people mm. try to represent dreams it it doesn't look like any dream i've ever had you know i was like my dreams aren't like that there's yeah. sort of this combination of the familiar and the strange and i think that it it really walks that line beautifully and it's it it really just sort of in that one moment you would just realize how horrible and wrong the experiments have been and i think it's what dr sazen has been doing to yeah. trill it's it's yeah so for me, like that's the thing that really redeems that story is is that sequence and the the beauty of the illustrations. Like every time they go to the avian, the aviary is is like that's really beautifully illustrated and it feels almost primeval or you know like they're going to the Garden of Eden or something like that. And it's it stands in real contrast to the rest of the ship, which is pretty sort of standard seventies eighties sci fi. Everything is clean and white and sterile looking, and and then there's this beautiful jungle on the ship. Yeah. I'm trying to be like, ah, is this story, I feel like, you know, they were 11 at ends on like a pretty happy note. And mm-hmm. like overall, this collection ends on a, a solidish note. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the first, the first two stories are like pretty disturbing. But then I'm like, ah, I feel like those two stories line up best with more of her like more realistic short stories, though, in A mm-hmm. Drunken Dream and other stories. Because I felt like those were more like dark at times. Than... Oh wow, yeah, you know, you definitely want to have a bottle of scotch on hand before you sit down in a drunken dream because <laughs> those stories will make you. I I, I cannot, and it's funny because I, I read a lot of manga and it, you know, and I'm moved by it in some way, but I I, I ugly cry when I read Iguana Girl because oh my god, is, some... is that your favorite? Because that's my favorite. That's my f- yeah. Okay, I, yes. I absolutely. So <laughs> all right, so you first. Why is it your favorite? Oh my, I mean, definitely of all of the ones that were in there, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to cry about this story. Like it, it has such a good juxtaposition between like, oh, the iguana is cute and this is like funny at times. And then just like, it's just like deathly crushing in the way that Mm -hmm. it's like, no, everybody thinks that like, she thinks that she's ugly. Other people see her as a, a regular girl except for like her mom or whatever <laughs> right? Uh, for, for all these things. And I'm like, oh, it's so relatable and cute and also sad and like so yeah. distressing. <laughs> well, you know, I think it, the thing that it, it really struck me is, is that for, I think, especially as I've gotten older, you know, one of the things I, I've realized when I'm teaching is that when you're, you're interacting with somebody who reminds you of the worst aspects of yourself, it can be very difficult, things you don't like about yourself, difficult to just deal with them as a separate individual and not impose all of your own fears and self-doubt on that person. And parents wrestle with this too. You know, you have a, a daughter or a son and that child embodies some aspect of yourself that you don't like. And you see that in them and and you're sort of repelled by it because it's like holding up a this mirror to yourself. And the way Hajio does it, you know, where there's this possible element of magical realism or just the iguana could simply be a metaphor for the way, you know, like the ugliness Rika goes that, through life. Yeah. Right, her ugly, you know, the way, the way she feels rather than it being some sort of literal thing. Um, and, you know, the interactions, you can see how vulnerable she is and you can see how much her mother's self-hatred and fear of being exposed comes out in her interactions with her. And it's it's really powerful. I mean, every time I read it, I was just like, oh, my God. I need another Kleenex. You know, it's just, it really, it's a gut punch. And yet it has such a lovely ending. Yeah, like lovely things happen in it. And like, I really like the moment where the sister, who is not cursed with anybody thinking that she's an iguana, uh, mm-hmm. you know, she's like, oh, wait, like she starts being a little bit of a jerk, like not like the worst manga character I've ever encountered, but like <laughs> not the best manga character I've ever encountered, right. you know? And then she has this moment where, you know, like, Rika, the the iguana girl, like confronts her and is like, "Oh yeah, well, I mean, this is just how everybody's like treated me throughout my life. Like it's a self fulfilling prophecy." And then she's like, "Huh? 
that's true. Like, our mom is mean to you. Like, maybe I should, like, tell her not to be mean to you for a second. And yeah. I was like, that's so nice. <laughs> so nice yeah well i think it has a lot to say about things like sibling dynamics and rivalry and you know particularly mother-daughter relationships although i can certainly imagine that there are plenty of fathers who feel that way about their sons you know seeing some aspect of themselves and their sons they don't like and then like this beautiful resolution you know that rika finds her own family i love the way she initially sees her husband as a bull you know he's drawn this this sort of a, a you know quasi you know, sort of almost like a centaur or something. And and she loves him because he's sturdy and, and sort of emotionally stable. And, and, you know, the way she builds a life with him and the fact that his family embraces her, those are all things that I found, you know, it's like the first time I read it, I found it powerful, but I think, you know, now that I'm a little, even just that much older, it, it really like, Oh my God, it was such a gut punch. And it's such a beautiful ending, you know, that she makes peace with, with her mom and, and realizing how much her mom, was just really poisoned by her own self-loathing. It's, I, you know, for me, that's a really powerful story. Yeah, to come like overcome, or like not even overcome, but just like realize that it's like, oh, you know, because a lot of these stories also have to do with like, like even going back to the gender. It's a lot of mm-hmm. like, you know, how much can you choose to be who you are in terms yep. of your identity, and how much do other people affect who you become, and the choices that you can make, both literally yeah. and like physically, and all these things, and all these stories. Uh, so uh, you know, in the in the sci-fi stories, it, it does manifest more as like physically, can I become right. like can the unicorns become humans? Can they be male? Can they be female? Can they switch whenever they want to? Like all these right. things. <laughs> Whereas the the more realistic ones are like, oh, you know, much more interpersonal human drama. Like I am connected to my sister and my mother and like they have influenced me in these ways. But I have also come and like been my own person. (laughs) And yeah, does where does this legacy end? Where does where do I begin and where does like the poison from them (laughs) come in? You know, all these things. Yeah. Well, I think, you know. The stories that 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 particular collection works really beautifully because it it illustrates that, you know, has stories from lots of different periods in Agio's work. So it goes back to the very beginning of her career and has more contemporary examples. And, you know, I I think for me, the Iguana Girl and then was it Marie, I think, or I I don't know how you pronounce it. It, (laughs) Ten years later also resonated with me a lot. Just, you know, when you're in college, you form these bonds with people because you're, you know, you're breaking away from your parents, you're finding your own identity. And then you, you know, you often create these kind of instant families, you know, a small group of people that you hang out with and maybe you live with them. And it, it just, there's this kind of magical feeling that comes with that. I mean, I certainly remember having that experience in college you know, that it was a group of people. And when we were all in college together, it was really meaningful. And I felt really close to those folks. And then, you know, your life takes all these different directions. And I remember for a good part of my 20s, really hanging on to that feeling and and being sad when I realized that 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 moment had really passed. And that, you know, I was feeling, I was sort of filled with this nostalgia for something that I I couldn't recreate in, you know, my my post-college life. And that story, resonates with me i think too for for that reason just having it and looking back on that experience and and just sort of recognizing it as a sort of normal part of of growing up and and entering adulthood that makes sense i really think iguana girl resonated with me the most but the second story i'm trying to remember was called okay yeah girl on porch with puppy is oh like, yeah that's a that's out <laughs> I know. that one's we that one like is the one that I keep being like, that was, that sure was a story, I guess. <laughs> That's like. Yeah. Well, it's, it's dark. You know what? It, it reminds me more like Shirley Jackson. Like it, it just has a really dark ending and it's a little ambig, you know, like the girl disappears. Yeah. Oof. And it, it, I there's think something she died. very, I think so too. But then, you know, did she and her puppy, you know, I feel like I should check does the dog die.com to see whether her pooch made it or not because I wasn't clear from the illustration. But yeah, so it's a really weird... It's weird. It's super weird. (laughs) I think that's the weirdest one, actually. (laughs) Like, it's not even the supernatural... I don't know. I guess it was like, it was realistic up until the very end. They all point at her and she disappears and you're like, excuse me, what now? (laughs) Right. 
Well, I guess that was one of the reasons I thought about Shirley Jackson was that, you know, it, it exists in this space where it's everything seems OK. It's sort of normal, almost hyper normal. And everybody wants you to behave and have good manners and do do what you're told. And that the gr- little girl's transgression, just her unwillingness to do that in in a, in a you know, not in a, in a bratty way. She just doesn't she likes hanging out with her puppy, um, <laughs> you know, at least this sort of really like savage ending. It was like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, what's going on? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Moto Hajio loves to kill off her characters. <laughs> at least it seems that way in a drunken dream. There are a lot of. Dead yeah. people in that series. <laughs> in that They're series like history. already dead. They die right? throughout it. Yeah. Yeah. So of the three collections, which one did you like the best? Oh, boy. I think I did like They Were Eleven the most. Just because, again, we don't get that much sci-fi shoujo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also, I, I just feel like it has enough room, I guess, to be like it's it's a short manga, right? But it's not yeah. it's not a short story necessarily. Again, it's like a novella, yeah. so it was like, oh, this is a solid story. We got time with like all of these characters, and I like I'm mm-hmm. impressed by the economy of pages <laughs> and to story. You know, it was just like very solid. It was I was impressed with its its gender exploration, and impressed with like. The world, I think it's fun that like A Prime and They Were Eleven kind of like interconnect and that there's still like Terran uh, terminology. Mm-hmm. Like there's this, clearly she's just like created this sci-fi world and she's like, yeah, and all of my stories kind of like take place somewhere in it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I'd have a hard time picking, although I do think if you haven't read anything by her, um, a Drunken Dream is sort of like a, a nice, it's sort of like a Whitman sampler, lots of different genres and styles. And, yeah. you know, and if you, you sort of want to get a sense of where she fits into the history of shoujo manga, that that might be one way of dipping your toes in the water. But I think just for sheer fun, They Were Eleven is, is the most fun by, by a long shot. It just, as I said, it's got that kind of next generation vibe. You can yeah. almost imagine Captain Picard coming on at the end and you know, delivering some kind of little sermon and, you know, making this Earl Grey tea. It just kind of has that feeling to it. But it at the same time, it grapples with lots of really big issues and it's fun and, you know, it's a little bit silly too. And, and I love it. So. Yeah. If you don't want to cry, read They Were Eleven. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think that's a, that's a good way of putting it. If you, if you do not feel like you want to have a Kleenex on hand, because that's definitely, that's definitely not one that, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't yeah. have the same emotional impact as the as the other two collections for yeah. sure. If you do want to cry, read the other two. <laughs> yes. Guaranteed to make you cry. Something the... in them is gonna make you cry. Yes. <laughs> and if you don't, you're heartless. <laughs> no. that, I know. I had this argument when somebody didn't like a guana girl. I was like, What? What? I don't think we can be friends. Yeah, anymore. are you not friends anymore? I think that <laughs> is the only proper response to this. <laughs> That is how much I like to Guana Girl. It is so good. <laughs> so- it is. It's really, it's it's so, and it seems like the most improbable thing. If you describe it to somebody, you just summarize the plot. It doesn't sound moving at all. And no. Yet, you're right. There's something about the, especially because, the, as you say, the Iguana, the, the Iguana version of Rika, the way Rika sees it's herself. She's so cute. She's cute and she's vulnerable and she's. You know, she's so, you know, innocent and she's you can see how she's crushed by all of the her mom's comments. And it's it's just so I, you know, I, like the first time I, I, I read it, I was only f- a few pages in. I was like, well, I'm not sure I'm going to get to the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it works really well, too, thinking about it, uh, like in terms of children's literature, like the way that mm-hmm. most children's characters are, cute little animal critters, right? And it's like, oh, that's totally right. what this story could be. But it's like, no, this 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 little cute character is, is bad. And I'm like, you can't convince me that she's bad. <laughs> like, right. You can't tell me that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, like why she chose that particular strategy. But I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, in many ways, I think it invites you to put yourself in... in you know, Rika's shoes in, in a way that, that if she was drawn simply as a human child, she might not, she might not seem actually as vulnerable. We, uh, oddly, uh, you know, as weird as that might be to say, I think that there's something about the fact that she's, that's how she sees herself that makes her so much more, so much more vulnerable. Yeah. And there's the, the moment where, uh, I think the moment that really devastated me was she, she buys a, a present for her mom, which is like a yes. little handheld mirror 
And then her mom is like, how much does this cost? And it costs like $15 or whatever. <laughs> and right. Her mom is like, what a waste of money. Go return it. And in going to return it, Rika's like standing on a bridge uh, where she wants yeah. to like, throw the mirror away. But she first looks into it and you're like, at first I'm like, oh, it's it's fine. She's going to like see her her human self because it's like in pictures right. and stuff. Even her mom sees her as as human. But it, it shows her as the iguana in the mirror. And I was like, no. <laughs> So yeah, sad. I don't think I could sit through an animated version of this story. I think I would probably need therapy <laughs> no. or just an IV drip to replace all the, the, the lost fluids as I sobbed uncontrollably. But yeah, that's one that it's a good cry, though. It's, it's a, a good, good cry. cry. It is. It but is. it's just like, oh, I didn't know I could yeah. be so attached to an iguana. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so I feel like we should get to the legitimately somewhat silly, but maybe somewhat serious discussions okay. about gender and things part of this podcast, which is Shipping Corner, unless you have something else you really want to discuss. No, I don't think so. I think I, I have to say, it, shipping wise, though, I, I looked through that and I was like, hmm. I don't know. I think these ships have saved. <laughs> these ships have. I know. I'm not saying that any of them are healthy, but they were implied to be things. So oh, we yeah. Have to oh, definitely. <laughs> All right. So your top pick for for ship. Well, I mean, okay. I wrote them like somewhat in order that I read it. I guess. Yeah. So it was Froll ex Tata because they have a very explicit conversation in which you know yes. Froll is very distraught that they're going to not pass the test because they didn't right. complete because Froll got sick so they they, they right. pressed the button c to say that there's an emergency and, he's a, and they're like no it, it's before the 53 days that we were supposed to live together <laughs> whatever right and Tata's like you know Froll but like I, I can you know kind of like save you if you you know if you it's just that you don't want to marry a, a crappy dude on your your planet like I, you can marry me instead like become a lady marry me <laughs> and I was like okay right. Okay, Tata. And, and Froll seems into that, actually, for like a, yeah. a hot second, you know, when, when they think that they're not going to pass the test. I guess once they pass the test, it's like, oh, peace. <laughs> I'm <Right>. done here. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, Tata's a little sad about it. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, overall, I, think it was I thought probably they were the, cute. The least problematic ship of, of, of the four. Like, you know, I was yeah. thinking about their relationships. Like, that's that's one. I think you're right that the, the comedy aspect softens some of the some of it. And as I said, I, I, it sort of strikes me like they, they have a kind of a screwball comedy relationship anyway. They bicker a lot and argue over really silly stuff. And that's, you know, sort of meant to show us that they're they're really meant for each other on some level. Um, or at least that's, you know, sort of that's kind <laughs> that's of fine. The, yeah, that's that's the deal there. Yeah. So like overall, I'm like, OK, I, I like this. I don't know that I like the like oh it's okay consolation prize become a woman <laughs> right, <laughs> with me right. thing i'm like mm, <laughs> okay like Tata, right. i don't think you i don't think you understood <laughs> that question but all right that's fine your heart was in a good place tata your heart was in yes. a good place so like if they got together because frol agreed to it i'd be like that's fine i i, I, I dig it <laughs> I, I could read some fan fiction about that <laughs> like yeah, I think of of all of the pairings, that was the one that that struck me as least problematic and something that where you could have a lot of fun with it if you were inclined to write fanfic. Some of the other ones, I think, it would be so emotionally tortured. Um, you know, <laughs> Definitely, Morin so that... and Trill was just off the table. I was like, nope, no, 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 no. no, 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 just, no. Yeah, that, but more like, intacto is that off the table? Or are they cool? I, I think they could be a couple. I mean, you know, either way, whichever way Tacto decides to go. I mean, I think that they'd, they'd be fine that Maury has, has reconciled himself to feeling like he's this this spirit that has, you know, that, that he saw in Trill is is present in, in Tacto and, you know, and he feels this powerful connection to Tacto. So, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly could imagine that there's, I, I'm sure, I, I imagine, I'm sure it's out there somewhere on the internet. Someone has written Somebody has fan written this fiction. Fan fiction. About, oh, please. I mean, you know, I mean, even in English, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it exists in Japanese, but I, I mean, just thinking about it in English, I'm sure somebody has, has shipped them through many stories just because it's, there's a really like fervid intensity to the way the two of them interact. And um, I could definitely yeah. see that, that leading to some fanfic. 
Yeah, actually, it's like Maury's the, you know, so Maury's the thing that sucks about him and Trill. He's like, he's not there yet in that relationship. Mm -hmm. But then in Maury and Tacto, it's like, oh, Maury's the one who got there. Tacto is the one that I'm like, oh, that that boy still needs her, the, whatever he decides to be. You know, yeah. They decide to be. He, they uh, need some uh, time to, to figure that all that out. Yes. Because, I mean, it's pretty late in the story that they go to meet Tacto's dad. Right. And the dad is like, yep, I invented this, uh, <laughs> this drug where you can change sexes. And then, uh, you know, he wasn't supportive of his partner's <laughs> sex changes, right. multiple sex changes. And uh, so they died or whatever. I'm like, oh, right. dark. <laughs> yeah, that, that that whole bit is is like, it, it's just, what, what? It, I mean, it goes by in a, in a blur because it, it happened. It's just such a, a left turn. You're not really expecting it. And as you're processing it, all of a sudden, you you know, like you, you get the big reveal and you know why Tacto has been suppressing his emotions and and what that that whole whole thing is about. And you almost don't process the most shocking part of it, which is, you know, the the whole serum and the changing back and forth. I mean, I guess of, of all of the pairs Reg and Addy's clones are probably the most normal. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and almost they seem so vanilla in comparison with some of the other matchups. It's like, well, I'm sure they'll be okay because they don't remember they don't remember each other, so everything should be good. Everything's good. Yeah, that's true. There's like it's like Addy and Reg, it's like, what does that even mean, actually? It's like uh, original Addy and original Reg, like they seem fine, that's fine. Clone Addy and original Reg, not fine. No, don't do that. And then it's like Clone Addy and Clone Reg. Oh, that's fine too. That that's probably fine. <laughs> yeah. So I don't I don't know. I mean, you know, I have to confess, I I, I really am not put much of an oar in the fan fiction uh, fiction world just because I, I you know, I discovered manga pretty late. I mean, I was in my early thirties, I think, when I, I started reading it. So I, it's just a part of the culture I've never never really experienced oh, i mean i know it's out fix. there i read a little bit out of <laughs> you know sort of you know anthropological curiosity like oh who dreamt that wow that's <laughs> a really weird crossover you know like battle royale and inuyasha who just thought of putting those two things you know, <laughs> you know like you read these really you weird wacky children on the internet <laughs> beautifully specific and 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 totally individual uh you know sort of mashups of stories and characters and plot lines and stuff and and it's it's really fascinating, but I I have to admit I have never really been a participant or a big consumer of it. So when you're like the shipping corner, I'm like, uh oh, yeah, whoa, you're like it's scary, it's, it's scary, it's it's a little scary. And it I was like, and then of scary. course, <laughs> being old like me, I was like, ooh, UPS, <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> amazing. No, just you know the cute the cute couples or the not yeah. so cute couples. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if any of them were really cute. I think. They, they were like fascinating, strange, problematic, maybe a little amusing. I don't, I don't know. There was, there was a lot of weird stuff. Rika going on and her stories. bull, bull husband are great. There you go. There, I ship, I ship. Them. We ship them. They're we do. fine. Iguanas and bulls forever. Yes, that's a that sure is a note for this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> There's a sentence I don't think I've ever said anywhere before in any other context. So I know. Yeah, see, look, look at all that original content we're making. <laughs> all right. Well, do you have any uh, other final thoughts? Like, should people? I, I want to be like, people should go read this, but it's so hard because it's so expensive to find these things used. It is, but I think if you're interested in what we've talked about today, the best bet is the library. If you don't want to spend a lot of money, you can definitely find copies of AA Prime and A Drunken Dream in libraries. If your local library doesn't have it, one of the easiest ways to find it is to see whether first whether your local library has some kind of interlibrary loan program. So where I am up on the yeah. North Shore of, of, of Massachusetts, I can log into my library system's website, and if they don't have a copy of a book, I can do a broad search and request something from, you know, a copy from any other uh, member of the network that they belong to. And it's usually delivered to my local library in two or three days. Um, so if you're not taking advantage of that at your library, you should, because that could definitely put you in touch with like a drunken dream, which is something that I think libraries bought because it's hardcover and it's prestigious and it's, it got awards and people were talking yeah. about it. And so it has all the things that a library would think, Ooh, if patrons want to put this out, see, we have a graphic novel. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, we so have. I, I, <laughs> a novel. So um, I would definitely say try your library for that. And you may find AA Prime as well, depending on when the library got hip to buying gra graphic novels. Um, that might take a little bit more searching. But you can also find used copies of that on Amazon that are not outrageously expensive. Um, so if you're interested in what we've been talking about, I would start with your library uh, first. And then, as, as you mentioned, Ashley, at the beginning of the podcast, um, They Were 11 is available cheaply. Yeah. You know, on Amazon, if you're willing to buy it in floppy form, and you're not holding out to get it in four shoujo stories. Four shoujo stories is so expensive. <laughs> it is. I locked into a copy years ago for about twenty five dollars. Wow, you stole like, that copy. <laughs> I did. I feel like I should write a send somebody like a, a little three a check. You know, it's like, well, actually, but then I was like, you know what? It's just a book, so I'm I'm hanging on to it and I know, you got trying that. not to crack the spine too often because it the binding is terrible. It's like I you know <laughs> I was trying to read it in the tub and I realized I was going to lose pages because the glue was breaking. And oh, you need to re-glue it. <laughs> I know, I know. So you know, libraries try World Cat too because that can also alert you to to it being in collections where you might not have thought of something in your area where you might be able to get it. And, you know, and if you don't want to spend the money or the time to find this old stuff, you know, keep an eye out for the book. And I think that's released like August 29th is, is when it's Fanographics is coming out. And, um, I've already seen Deb Aoki raving about it on Twitter and posting a couple of pics and, and just swooning over the artwork and the story. So, um, <laughs> that's all the endorsement I need. That's all. Yes. Everybody should go get that. Um, but yeah, okay. So uh, everybody, thanks for listening to Show Joe and Tell. If you have any comments, questions, constructive criticism, or concerns, you can uh, email Show Joe and Tell at gmail.com or leave a comment on Show Joe and Tell dot com slash motohagio. And we're at Show Joe and Tell on Twitter, Instagram, and what other things? I mean, there is a Facebook, but don't go there. Facebook sucks. <laughs> Tumblr. Tumblr is another place. Yes. Um, and Kate, where can people find you and your work on the internet? Uh, they can find my work in two places. They can find me talking to other people on Twitter under the handle Manga Critic. So that's Manga underscore Critic. And um, I'm in the process of revamping my blog right now, but you can find me at MangaCritic.com. I'm also contributing to the weekly features at Manga Bookshelf. Um, particularly, we do a pick of the week, which comes out on every Monday, where we sift through what's arriving in, in comic book stores, and each one of us in the Manga Bookshelf collection picks one. So you can find me there. And um, you'll also, if you, you do Google searches for some of my older manga reviews, you'll find me at the School Library Journal. Um, I wrote a few things for the Hooded Utilitarian, and I'm just around. I'm on the net. So. You're on the net, yeah. <laughs> on the net. You're and hit. nothing says... <laughs> An old person like, calling it the net, yeah. sort of calling it the World Wide Web. You're on the World Wide Web, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm on the World Wide Web. Excellent. Well, Ashley, oh. thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's really been a lot of fun. You've made me think about these stories in new ways. And I really, it was just a real pleasure to meet you and chat with you today. So thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, I know I'm so thankful that you responded and came on. I was like, yes, this is a big dream. <laughs> like... oh, oh, thank you. Are you excited every time you see a new episode from us? If so, please consider leaving a rating in iTunes or Stitcher. This will help the podcast reach more hearts, or at least ears. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next time for A Silent Voice by Yoshitoki Oima. I'm sorry that I cannot, I did not say that well, <laughs> but uh, maybe by then I'll figure it out. This will be our first Shonen Exception covered on the podcast, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm finally making good on that promise, although I don't, I don't know how many of you are excited for that. I mean, a silent voice in particular you might be excited about, so uh, stay tuned. Until then, bye. Bye.